first time in five years we've had this training in the state. And the first time in, I believe it was 10 years since we've had it in Boise. So um, it's good. I've got some people, to, by the way, my name is John Myers. I'm the director of the HUD office here. And on behalf of HUD and our Fair Housing Forum, I want to welcome you to this event. And I've got some people I'd like to th thank. And I'd also like to mention that the experiment we're doing, we are broadcasting this to some nine sites around the state. Five of those sites are monitored so that the people can get their credits, and the others are just people sitting at their desks, you know, logging in. Um, we're, we can do that because of Douglas Peterson and our AMA in the state paid for it and got it done for us. So I want to thank Douglas, are you here? I want to thank Douglas and uh, for you people on remote, um, if you have questions, you can email them to fairhousingfirst at gmail.com and we will get them up to our instructor. Um, other people I want to thank, besides all the members of the Idaho um, Fair Housing Forum, I want to thank um, Phil Seavers, who's our uh, web guru and technical, will keep us online. I want to thank Idaho Housing and Finance Association for their help. Eric Kingston, Brady Ellis, Shane Seeley, Craig Stoddard. I want to thank the Intermountain Fair Housing Council, Zoanne Olson, Carrie House, Bill Brown, Allison Brace, and Lynn Lopez. The Northwest ADA Center, Dana Grover. Um, Alma, as I said before, Douglas Peterson. Uh, several of our cities that are hosting those remote um, broadcasts. Uh, and um, Jennifer Yost from the city of Napa is here and has been helping us um, this morning and, and Mark at this. But the cities of Pocatello, Coeur d'Alene, Lewiston, and Idaho Falls. Um, I want to thank Thornton Oliver Keller, the building here, for letting us use this, and Northwest Nazarene University for letting us use one of their circuits to, to broadcast this. Um, just some necessities. Uh, if you need to use a restroom, they are right outside to the left. And if during a break those get full, if you go across the main lobby and down the hall on the other side, there is another set of restrooms. Um, the there is no food allowed in this auditorium, but you, you can drink coffee or, or whatnot. And for lunch, uh, we have a cafeteria here in the building just outside the doors and to the right. Um, welcome to use that. We will be handing out evaluation forms at the end of this meeting. and Very much appreciate you taking the time to uh, uh, fill those out and let us know what we could do better or um, how we can improve this. Um, question, how many of you are architects? I see a show of hands. Wow, wow. Okay, how many of you are builders? Okay, any attorneys? Okay, attorneys, um, if you want to get credit for this, see Zoanne Olson and give her, and that's Zoanne back there, and give her your bar number and she can arrange for you to get credits for this class. Um, my office puts out a, a bulletin about once a week called FY Idaho. It goes to a subscription list, it's a listserv, and within the next day or two, each of you will get an email from me inviting you to join that list. And you just type in subscribe and return it to me and I'll, I'll sign you up for the list. It's free and what we try to cover in it is any um, trainings that we're having, any NOFAs, Notices of Funds Availability, um, any changes in FHA or fair housing rules that we think would be of importance. We have over 800 people on that list already and um, I try not to, to send you too many of them so I think it's worth your while to sign up, and I urge you to do so. Um, 
Let's see, we've talked about uh, where to email the letters to. I guess without further ado, I'm going to in introduce our instructor, uh, Mr. Jack Catlin. Uh, Jack is an architect. Uh, he's been doing these for over 20 years. He um, has a licensed architect, a member of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, Mr. Catlin's the first practicing architect to serve as chair of the U.S. Agriculture and Transportation Barriers Compliance Board. That's a mouthful. Architectural and Transportation Barriers oh, Compliance okay. Board. Um, uh, Mr. Cat, I mean, he was here 10 years ago and four I years ago. Was, yeah. So, yeah. so he is our go-to guy on this. And uh, I won't even go through all the different modules. I'll let him speak for Perfect. himself on that. Thank okay, you, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, is this too loud? No? All right. If it gets too loud, let me know. If it's not loud enough, if it falls off, let me know like it just did. All right, well, I took care of that. I'll try again. We'll see if it works. If it falls off and you can't hear me in the back, scream. I think I'll be able to hear you. Um, as John said, I am an architect. I'm with a firm called LCM Architects in Chicago. We're kind of unique in, the, in that we, about half of our practice has to deal with conventional architecture. We do a lot of work in higher education at the moment. But the other half of our practice is really focused on accessibility and universal design. And within the accessibility field, uh, we focus on Title II and Title III of the ADA, as well as the Fair Housing Act. Uh, we do provide these trainings all across the country. Uh, this is maybe my 40th training doing this. Uh, I get asked an awful lot in situations like this, well, you travel around the country a lot, uh, what are your favorite cities? And believe it or not, I'm not running for office, so I don't have to say this, but I'm going to. I always say Boise, Idaho. I, for, the, for the past 15 years, I've said Boise. There's an amazing amount of energy here. The folks are terrific. You guys are really interested in doing this stuff and doing it right, and you're great. And I always look forward to coming back to Boise. When we're putting these schedules together, uh, the Pacific Northwest is one of those areas that I want to always focus on, but particularly Boise, if we can get back to Boise. So HUD doesn't want us repeating year after year after year in the same location, but I'm always pushing to get back here because I love it out here. Um, John asked about architects. Very impressive that there's that many architects here. Uh, let me ask you a question about civil engineers. Any civil engineers in the audience? Two, terrific, three, four. All right, great. That's a record for civil engineers. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about site conditions and, and what the, those areas that civil engineers are really responsible for, or usually responsible for. So uh, great. Uh, four people in the audience. I've only had, the most I've ever had before was two, and they got up and left before we got to the site stuff. <laughs> so you guys are setting a record. Uh, terrific. Uh, are there any uh, code officials in the audience? Folks responsible for enforcing local code? Terrific. Uh, advocates, people that are advocates for people with disabilities. All right, this is about as diverse a group as I've ever been in front of, and this, is, this excites me. This is terrific. Speaking of exciting, nothing is more exciting to me than doing this. <laughs> so if I forget about breaks, you guys right here are empowered in the front row to throw something at me at about 10 o'clock, 10.15, somewhere around 10 o'clock, a few minutes before, get my attention and don't be shy, talk about where's the, when's the break gonna happen, all right? If you need to get up and leave the room, go ahead and do it. Don't worry about it. But uh, we will be taking a break at 10. We'll be taking a break uh, at, for lunch hour. And unfortunately, lunch is on you. So I'll be joining you at your table. Uh, HUD can't afford that. They can afford to bring me in, but they cannot afford to, to, uh, to uh, uh, buy lunch as well. This morning, we're going to focus on a three-hour uh, session overview of the design and re construction requirements of the act. And then this afternoon, we are going to focus on the common areas within a building site. We're going to focus on the, I think it's kitchens, is that what we're doing? Bathrooms at the end. 
and we're going to be talking about the site issues. Now, we're going to be talking about site issues this morning, and we're going to, all of this stuff we're going to talk about, we're going to cover this morning, and then we're going to dive in a little bit deeper this afternoon. So some of this your stuff you're going to hear twice. So think about some questions you might have. I want to take questions as they come up, because we're going to have diagrams up on the screen. And it's much easier, particularly for engineers and architects, because we relate to pictures better than we do words. <laughs> so if there's a diagram up there, let's talk about the diagram. If there's a question about that diagram, let's talk about that. I give a lot of presentations with lawyers. And I'll tell you, for those of us that are in the design profession, there's a huge difference. I mean, we all know there's a big difference between lawyers and architects and engineers. But this presentation, if it was done by a lawyer, there would be no diagrams in it. It would just be 12-point text up there, solid. Does the architect or does the lawyer in the back agree with me? No? Good. Good. It's rare. It's rare. So we got a lot of diagrams and uh, just a few words, all right? My job is to fill in the blanks, all right? So if you have questions about this, ask them. Let's, let's, we want this to be a two-way uh, two session today. And it's, it's going to keep things a little more lively as well. Um, we will probably, depending on how many questions we get, we will probably beat our 4.30 time. It's my experience that particularly in these strategies for compliant bathrooms, we've got an hour and a half scheduled for that. That usually takes considerably less time than an hour and a half, right? Because we're going to go through it this morning and we're going to go through it this afternoon. All right, that said, let's get started. And first of all, an apology. This is the first time I've used this type of remote. And I'm probably going to be, and it doesn't have a laser pointer on it, so I'm going to be putting things down and picking things up. So I apologize for that. And the way I operate this in the past, it's always been button on the right, button on the left. But this is a, a, a roller, so I am probably going to be messing up a number of times and trying to figure this out. So bear with me, please. All right, this is uh, Fair Housing First. Right? Uh, this is a uh, training that, and, uh, that is offered by HUD. Uh, I don't work for HUD. Uh, we, my firm has a contract with HUD to provide a, a number of services, including this type of training. Um, and the reason for this is, HUD's reason for this is to increase the amount and the supply of basically accessible housing throughout the country. Uh, when the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1991, it's pretty much determined that there was very, very little accessible housing throughout the country. And so uh, HUD got a, 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 a number of stakeholders together, all right? Is there builders, and disability rights advocates, government officials, trade associations, media code officials, enforcement agencies. What we don't see on here is architects. All right, we don't see engineers. Now, I'm assuming that that is, falls under the trade associates, because I know the American Institute of Architects was involved in uh, working with HUD at the very beginning. But they got eight, over 850 stakeholders together to say, OK, if we do this, what are you guys looking for? What, what do you need? And the first thing out of their mouth was comprehensive training. We need to know what you expect us to do. All right. And then they said, and we're going to need some sort of ongoing technical assistance. And so HUD did that. They set up this training program. They developed the, the FHA design manual. Many of you are probably familiar with the design manual. That, that was an outgrowth of this, uh, this session with 850 stakeholders. And they set up a website. And I'm telling you that I, I was not involved in setting any of this up. We, we got involved and took over this much later. But it is a terrific website. Right? So go to the website, www Fair Housing Act. If you have questions about the Fair Housing Act, get into that website. Uh, there is on that website now about 100 questions and answers. Those Q&As have been vetted by HUD. Right? So HUD has approved of that answer. That's there. So if you're designing a kitchen or a bathroom and you have a particular question, take a look at the website first. Find that Q&A on the website and take a look at it. Uh, because it may give you direction. 
There is the, the design manuals on the website. You can do download the design manual. You can download it page by page, or you can download the entire design manual. So there's an awful lot of information there. For attorneys, there is case law that's on the website. So if you have, or even architects have questions about, well, what, what, are, what are the legal requirements? And you want to take a look at, at the history of case law, that's there in a very abbreviated way, but it'll give you uh, direction on how to find the uh, uh, detailed information. So during this training session, we will overview of the Fair Housing Act. We're going to talk about the safe harbors. What are the standards you need to comply with to be in compliance? And then an overview of the technical requirements of the Fair Housing Act. All right. During this training, we will discuss detailed technical specifications. And we're going to get very detailed. We're going to start at 50,000 feet. We're going to get down to a quarter of an inch. All right. So all of that between 50,000 feet and a quarter of an inch we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about requirement, required suggestions uh, uh, for achieving compliance, and then the resources. And again, the resources are going to be the, uh, the, the, the website. So that website, constantly going to be getting back to that website. Um, requirements and suggestions. As we go through, let me ask this question. How many of you architects and engineers are involved, are involved in multifamily housing? How many aren't? Let me put it that way. Yeah, every, okay, one. So very few. So um, those of you that are involved in multifamily housing, you understand there is just a little bit of gray area in the Fair Housing Act, okay? Just a little bit here and there. Um, I'm aware of that. We're aware of that. As we go through here today, these requirements, and talk about them, I am going to do my best to say, if it is my opinion, this is how I would do it. I want to be very clear about the fact that there may not be a very a, a, a real black and white answer to some of these issues. You guys are aware of that. In those situations, I want to preface my response by saying, this is my opinion, this is what I believe. Right? So that doesn't necessarily mean that HUD would back me up. I think they would. I think I'm giving a conservative answer that HUD would support, but they might not. Some of this is going to be my opinion. All right? Some of this is going to be what I understand HUD wants me to teach. Some of this is what HUD has vetted and approves. And some of this is going to be my opinion. And I will try to let you know when it's my opinion that it is, in fact, my opinion. All right, at the end of the session, you'll be able to describe the Fair Housing Act's design and construction requirements. We are going to talk about 1,628 specific dimensions and how they apply to multifamily housing. You will know every one of those, and each three options to every one of those, all right? Or you're not getting out of this room. It's as simple as that. There will be a test. Um, list the types of properties that are subject to the Fair Housing Act. That, you could, that you're going to be able to do, all right? Because that is short and sweet. One of the few things that's short and sweet about the act, right? That is short and sweet and is easy to understand. You're going to be able to apply the FHA technical requirements to future design and construction. If you're not able to apply it, ask questions. We will figure that out. And then again, resources. So let's get into this. We are now flying at 50,000 feet. The Fair Housing Act was passed. The Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. It was signed into law two weeks, I think it was two weeks after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. All right. um, it is enforced by Housing and Urban Development. HUD enforces it. If somebody has a complaint, a citizen has a complaint, and they want to file that complaint with the federal government, they can, get, they can get a hold of HUD, and they can file that complaint. If HUD sees what they believe is a pattern in pr and practice of a builder or an architect, or whoever's responsible for this, if they see that there is a pattern, uh, they turn it over to Department of Justice if they think there's a pattern practice. If DOJ agrees that there is a pattern practice, DOJ may litigate. They don't always litigate, but they may litigate. I've been involved in, as an expert on both sides as defendant expert and an expert for the Department of Justice. We're involved in the case right now. Um, I will tell you that there, there's two agencies you do not want to get involved with in the federal government. The IRS is one. 
DOJ is the other one. Do what you can to avoid it. Uh, as we all know in here, even if you are completely, done everything completely right, just defending yourself can be problematic, all right? Can take a lot of time, a lot of resources. So you want to, if a complaint has been filed and HUD contacts you, try to resolve it. Try to resolve it. You do not want it turned over to the Department of Justice. Uh, state, some state and local fair housing enforcement agencies, there are FIPS that I understand in this area that are empowered to enforce the Fair Housing Act, and then private lawsuits in federal and state courts. I got involved in the Fair Housing Act 12 years ago because I was asked to be an expert for a developer, basically out on the East Coast, but I had 71 properties that uh, were involved in litigation. And we visited all 71 properties. We visited all 71 properties with the plaintiff's expert. And that expert went around and looked and determined in, in these properties what barriers existed. If we didn't agree with them that these were, in fact, barriers, we'd have discussions in the field right there. Some of those were resolved. If we, the, the two experts, did not agree, then it would be turned over to the lawyers. And if, then the lawyers would take over and try to figure out what, in fact, was it took us a year and a half to look at 71 properties. And it took two to three years to, to resolve this. But they were, a, they were a big organization. All right, what is covered under the Act? This is the easy slide. This is the easy one, right? The design and construction requirements apply to covered multifamily dwellings designed and constructed for first occupancy after March 13, 1991. Covered multifamily dwellings include all dwelling units and buildings contain a four or more units with an elevator. All ground floor units and buildings contain four or more units with an out, without an elevator. So let's break this down, all right? Design and construction requirements apply to all covered multifamily dwellings. Well, we're going to talk about what is a covered multifamily dwelling, all right? We're going to get into this a little bit of detail on this, but for the purpose of this discussion right now, it is any building that has four or more units in it. If there's four or more units in the building, it is covered by the Fair Housing Act. It does not matter if these were 100% federal government or state government financed or 100% private financing and these were high-rise luxury condominiums. No federal money, no state money, no city money, nothing. This is not about funding sources. This is about four or more units in a building. If there's four or more multifamily dwelling units in a building, it's covered by the Fair Housing Act. Designed and first constructed, uh, and designed and constructed for first occupancy after March 13th, 1991. All right, I'm sure you guys are doing this around here. We're doing this a lot in the city of Chicago and further east, everybody's doing this. Um, but taking old warehouse buildings and converting them into housing, loft, is that being done around here? I'm sure it is. All right. Taking old apartment buildings, upgrading them, flipping them into condominiums. I know that right now that's not happening, but it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and it's starting to happen again in, in Chicago, my hometown. Uh, we're starting to flip older buildings into condominiums. Uh, converting older apartments into condominiums, that's starting to happen. All right. So here's my question. If I'm going in and we're going to take an old warehouse building, uh, it was designed and constructed in 1922. Uh, it was a book depository. And it's, it was a book, depositor, book depository from 1922 to 1968. 1968, it closed. It's been vacant, empty, totally empty until last year. Last year, a builder said, you know what, that, 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 that make nice apartments or condominiums, doesn't matter. But let's say it's condominiums. That would make real nice condominiums. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to buy this building, I'm going to gut this building. I'm going to tear everything out of this building. The only thing that's left is the shell, the roof, and the floor slabs and the columns holding up the floors. All right? That's all that's left. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to build luxury high-rise or luxury condominiums within this loft conversion. And these things are going to go on the market and they're going to sell for $600,000 and up. Right? 
So you're putting in all the riser, the stacks for plumbing, you're putting every, all of that is brand, brand new. Is it covered by the act? All right? Most people will give me the answer yes. The answer is no. It is not covered by the act because it was designed, constructed for first occupancy uh, before March 13th, 1991. So if I have an apartment building that was first occupied on March 12th, 1991, and I'm now converting those apartments or remodeling those apartments, or doing anything to those apartments, it is not covered by the act. I lived in a high-rise condominium in Chicago, and they started building one uh, uh, next to my building back in 1990. And on March 12th, they hung a huge banner in front of this, and it was only, concrete was only a pathway, and they had a couple of model units on the first floor that were ready to go. They still had another 20 floors to add to this thing. They hung a big barrier, a big sign outside of the door on March 12th saying, for sale, units for sale. And I swear to God, somebody, some smart lawyer said, you know what, this was not designed to meet the Fair Housing Act. If we put this thing on the market after March 13th, we may have some fixing to do. If we put it on the market before March 13th, we don't. And so that's what they did, all right? So it doesn't matter what the building was designed and, constru and constructed for, nothing. Doesn't, that does not matter. If it was designed for whatever, if it was before March 13th, 1991, no matter what you do to it, it's not covered, with one exception. And it seems like there's always exceptions. I said if we're doing this, for example, uh, uh, loft building, if we were to tear the skin of this building off, take the roof and the skin, the outside exterior wa walls off, and then rebuild it, all right? Uh, we took the, the floors out, the columns out, but we, we rebuilt the, the, the structure as a, now as housing, but we reapplied the old skin to it. When there's a number of examples in my city that, that have done that and around the country uh, to maintain the historic uh, nature of the, of the area. Uh, if you do that, then, it's, then it's, it's, it's covered. So if you tear the structure out, right, tear the skin off and rebuild it using existing foundations, it's still covered, right? It's gonna be covered. So be, be aware of that. We will talk about the next two here. All, in an elevator serve building, 100% of the units are covered. Common areas, and 100% of the units are covered. The rationale for that, I believe, is that the level of accessibility for these units, and we'll get into this later, the level of accessibility for these units is very, very low in terms of accessibility standards. And the idea was, I think when HUD was putting this together, are we gonna look at a percentage of units that are very accessible, or are we gonna be looking at a lot of units that are minimally accessible? And they took the, the, a lot of units minimally accessible route. So once we get into these units, you're gonna notice that I should not be calling them accessible units because there is a category, type A for those, and let me ask this question. IBC, you guys use the IBC? Which one? 12. All right, well, 12 is not a safe harbor yet. But you know type A and type B anyhow. You know type A and type B. So the, the decision was made to go with a type B, a lower level of accessibility, but a much broader scope, much broader range of where those they have to apply. If you have a ground floor, uh, or if you have a building without an elevator, then just the ground floor. The ground floor doesn't mean it's that great. I mean, we're going to get into this in a little bit. It's the first level of housing. All right, in that building, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Housing that's not covered. Well, what isn't covered by the Act? Detached single-family houses, duplexes, triplexes, and multi-story townhouses, all right? Why aren't detached single-family houses, duplexes, and triplexes covered? Because it's less than four units. If it's four units or more, it's covered, all right? But if it's less than four units, it's not covered. Multi-story townhouses, all right? So if you have a townhouse, and I'm going to use the term townhouse, and I should. It's multi-story uh, units, all right? Because sometimes people advertise flats as townhouses. 
And it's not townhouses that are exempt. It's, it's multi-storied units, which more often than not are considered townhouses. If you have multi-stories, and we're going to get into detail on this, they are exempt. There are seven requirements for the Fair Housing Act, design and construction requirements, and we're going to go through each one of these in great detail today. Accessible building entrance on an accessible route. What does that mean? We'll get into it. Accessible and usable public and common use areas. Usable doors. Notice it doesn't say accessible doors. It says usable doors because accessible has a distinct definition. And we're going to have a different definition for usable doors in the units, with inside the units, right? Accessible routes into and through covered units, environmental controls, light switches, that sort of thing we're going to talk about, reinforced walls in bathrooms for, for future installation of grab bars. You're not required to provide the grab bars at the time of design and construction, right? When you construct it, you're not required to have the grab bars. But you are required to provide blocking in the walls in certain areas, and we'll get into all those details so that when somebody moves in, they can provide grab bars if they need them. And then we're going to talk about usable kitchens and bathrooms. And again, notice the word usable, not accessible. We're going to talk about safe harbors. There are 10 safe harbors. And I'm going to have to grab my book over here. But you've got eight of them here. There are two more. And just to so that I am going to be exactly right about this. I want to reference those two. So excuse me for going back and forth across the front of the room here, but I want to get this right. You guys are using 2012 IBC, is that right? Unfortunately, that is not a safe harbor. All right. I will, let me find, well, I don't have it here, and I went to all the trouble this morning to look this up just in case this slide, this slide should have the other two <coughs> safe harbors on it, but doesn't, so, oh. Bear with me. So you need to add these two to your list. We are in the process of, uh, process of updating this, so we will get. There are now 10 safe harbors. The two you want to add, number nine, is ICC. ANSI, A-N-S-I, A117.1, 2003. So that's short abbreviation for that. It's 2003 ANSI. But it has to be used with the Fair Housing Act itself, with the Fair Housing regulations, and with the FHA Fair Housing Act guidelines. All right? Number 10 is 2008 IBC. All right? 2012 IBC has yet to be adopted as a safe harbor. HUD is looking at it. They're in the process of doing that. Uh, they're looking at some ways to shortcut the, uh, the process here so they can turn these, these, uh, these around quicker. But 2012 is not yet a safe harbor. What is a safe harbor? Well, those of you who are familiar with the ADA, when the ADA was passed, Congress said develop guidelines. And the U.S. Access Board was charged with that uh, responsibility. I served on the U.S. Access Board for seven years. Our responsibility was to develop minimum guidelines that would be adopted by federal agencies like the Department of Justice. And when that happened, those guidelines became law. Right? And DOJ, in the case of Title III and Title II of the ADA, uh, had to take a look at our guidelines and had to adopt something that was at least as stringent as what the U.S. Access Board passed. So there is one standard under the ADA, all right? Uh, it was the, originally the 1991 standards. It was revised, now referred to as the 2010 ADA standards, and they're in effect. The Fair Housing Act is different, all right? Congress took a different approach with the Fair Housing Act, and they said that, that HUD had to develop minimum guidelines, which they did, 
But the Congress also said that until those guidelines were written by HUD, you could use ANSI 1986 as a standard. But ANSI 1986 went beyond what Congress intended residences to include. And so during a very short period of time, uh, before the guidelines were written, ANSI 86 was the standard. Congress said that when a new ANSI standard comes out, HUD needs to take a look at it, and if it meets HUD's minimum guidelines, then those ANSI standards would be considered a safe harbor. If you comply with a safe harbor, you are presumed to be in compliance with the act. Okay? There are 10 safe harbors now. Uh, the one that I like to talk a lot about is the Fair Housing Act design manual, particularly if you're back in this area. All right? If you're up with the new IBC 2003, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, 2000 with the 2001 supplement with IBC, you're in pretty good shape. But the Fair Housing Act design manual was, was written to answer a lot of questions that resulted from uh, the, the guidelines that were published in, I think, 1992. Uh, there were a lot of questions. So the design manual was written to answer a lot of those questions. So if you're doing design work, and you have questions, get on the website, take a look and see if those questions have been answered. Go to the design manual and see if the design manual answers those questions. Even though the design manual goes all the way back to 1998, HUD still uh, will abide by those answers. Now, HUD says that if you pick a safe harbor, and you can pick any one of the 10 safe harbors, all right, if you pick a safe harbor, you have to stick with that safe harbor. You have to follow that safe harbor for all the way through for all of your uh, design and construction questions. Right? If you start cherry, pick, cherry picking, going from one safe harbor to another, according to HUD, you may lose your safe harbor status. Right? Congress said that, that the guidelines were minimum standards and that state and local law can exceed those and can develop their own standards. So the, the, the guidelines are not required, they're not mandated, but they are a minimum standard of compliance. Right? So there are, beyond the guidelines, which is right up here, guidelines and supplemental notice, beyond that, there are now nine other documents you can use to design and construct. Okay? So unfortunately, you guys are using 2012. 2012 is not a safe harbor. My advice is, is, is look at 2008. Is everybody familiar with 2008? Were you using it for a while? Or 2009? Yeah. Were you using it for a while? Well, you, 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 you might want to still, you know, I'm looking at 2008 here, IBC. There was no 2000? Okay, that might have been a typo then. All right, 2009? All right, it's probably 2009. You still might want to, since it's a safe harbor, if you comply with 2009, you are in compliance with the act, all right, according to HUD. All right, question in the back. Yes, uh, what about the answer 2009? That may be where this confusion comes from, yeah. ANSI 2009 hasn't been, oh, go ahead. The mic so the um, viewers on the webcast can actually hear the question. Right. I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the 2009 ANSI 117.1, uh, which I queried HUD just this week, and they said it's okay to cite that uh, as well as the 86. Well, that's interesting. Uh, it's not on their list of approved safe harbors yet. Okay. Now maybe, may, you know, and I, HUD is sensitive about this because they're slow, they're slow doing this. So they are sensitive about this. I think that's good news that they said go ahead and use it. Uh, did you get it in writing? <laughs> I'm hoping to. <laughs> um, I would at least respond to them according to my conversation with so-and-so on such-and-such a date. This is what I was told. If I'm not 
you know, if I'm misunderstanding this, please let me know. I would try to get some confirmation on that. I would. Any other questions? We get we need the microphone down here. Or I can repeat I can repeat the question, right? Yes, I can repeat the question. Go ahead. All of them, yeah. The question is, if, if designer, designer is, is being asked to certify, are they using that word, that they are in compliance with all of the different federal regulations? Um, we do certification letters. One, my advice, make sure your attorney looks at what you're planning on writing. All right? But saying that, to the best of your knowledge, you are in compliance with these documents. If you use those documents to inform your design, that's what you used, then uh, make sure your attorney approves the language you use, but uh, it, it's to the best of your knowledge. We have language saying that others may differ with our opinion. That's our opinion. You know, Code officials don't always agree with architects. I think there are code officials in the audience. There's a lot of architects in the audience. Uh, sometimes over any issue, there's back and forth about what the code requires. This is not a code, this is a federal civil rights law. But the same sort of principle applies here. So I would, you know, I would sign that after the attorney looks at the language and saying to the best of your opinion, the best of your knowledge, this is my interpret, this is our interpretation. And that we use these documents to inform our design. Does that answer your question? Yep, I mean, you, you, need to, you need to pick one and stick with it here. I mean, you can't, not that anybody in the, this audience or anybody in America would do this, go through all these documents and find what's the least restrictive of each one of these. That's what HUD's worried about. Because there are subtle differences, subtle changes, as you guys know. There are subtle changes and differences in the, the ANSI's and in the IBC's. All right, so they're subtle. So in order to ma maintain some consistency, HUD says pick one, stick with it. If there's a conflict between the standards you have to use, because let's say, and we're going to talk about this, let's say you've got ADA requirements as well as Fair Housing Act requirements in a leasing office. All right? If you go with the more stringent of the two, you should be in good shape. All right? So we'll talk about this, but ADA back in the early days required van parking. Now IBC requires van parking, but some of these earlier safe harbors did not require van parking. Right? It only required accessible parking. Well, ADA required van parking as accessible parking at the leasing office because it's a public accommodation. So there were, there were differences between standards. And as long as you went with the more stringent, you should be okay. And if you need to say that in your letter, say it. This is how we approach this. We, we, we had a conflicting standard. We had to comply with both these different standards. We took the more stringent. And you should be okay if you do that. Another question back here? Yeah, and a question, sir, on the cherry picking. Uh, would you pick a, a safe harbor? Is that for the project? Or uh, I guess my question is, as the engineer on the site, I may choose uh, ANSI 92. What if the architect is using a different section? Is that based on the project or on the? The, 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 the question is coming from an engineer saying, civil engineer, yes. saying they're using one standard for their design and the architect may, uh, one safe harbor for their design and the architect may be using a different safe harbor. That is the first time I've ever had that question. My initial response is it is for the, so the question was, is this non-cherry picking HUD uh, 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 statement applied to the development, to the entire project? Or can one engineer use it one way and an architect use a, a different safe harbor? My advice is one safe harbor. Stick with one safe harbor. And, and uh, do you have a contract with the architect or with the owner normally? Both. 
All right. Then work that out at the beginning and what safe harbor you're going to be using so that you have a good understanding of what safe harbor you're going to be using. All right. Yes, sir. All right, I'm going to take back what I said earlier about you guys being great. <laughs> These are the toughest questions I've ever had. No more coffee for you guys, all right? No more coffee. All right, so the question is, does the, if the site predates the March 13th, 1991, is that what you're saying? No. Okay, say it again, please. So the question was if there was a separate site development as opposed to the architectural elements, the actual buildings on the site. And the site, is, does it predate March? No, site doesn't. So it's post. Then both have to comply. Both the site and the architecture is going to have to comply. Right? The same safe harbor. Uh, oh, gosh. It's smart. It would be smart to do that. It would be very smart to stick with that safe harbor. Uh, if there's reasons where that would be very, very, very difficult and the architects wanted to use a different safe harbor, notice what I said was that if you cherry pick, and let's say that falls under the definition of cherry picking, it wouldn't be for the same reason I mentioned earlier, but if you do cherry pick and use different safe harbors, you are subject to losing the protection of the safe harbor. If the reason you're doing that, if there's valid reasons for that, that may be a risk you're willing to take. But I would try to use the same safe harbor. All right? So I would try my best to use the same safe harbor for site as I do for the architecture, uh, unless there's really an outstanding reason why you can't. Uh, so that's, that's my best answer. And again, I would document why you're doing that before you get into actually doing it. Document your rationale. You might want to call, the, the phone number that I put up there also has, and I didn't mention this, sorry, also has a hotline. If you have a question, like you have a very good question, you can call that hotline. They will give you an answer, or in this case, because that's a very complicated question, that question is probably going to come to our office. And we've got experts in our office that will answer that question, taking more than two minutes of time to think about it, like I just did. They will answer that question. And they may say, eh, there's not a good answer to that question. And we would push that question up to HUD and say, HUD, we need direction from you on this. It is an unanswered question. So if you get these complicated questions, call the hotline. Call that number. And if, if you want to send sketches in or drawings in, with that, they will automatically, because there's drawings involved, they will get to our office. And we have a certain amount of time to respond to that, a certain amount of hours, because we know that you guys are in a hurry. You need to have this done. So it's not going to get, uh, those questions will be responded to within a very reasonable amount of time. Right? I think that's my official answer. If you got a tough question and you don't know, try calling the hotline and trying to get it in the document that you did that, and we'll take it from there. Any other questions about safe harbors? All right, terrific. Let me see if I can get this guy. All right, for the purposes of this uh, training, we are using the guidelines ANSI 86, real old ANSI. Some of you guys weren't even born in 86. Uh, we're looking at uh, ANSI 92, ANSI 98, the design manual, code requirements for housing accessibility 2000, and the IBC uh, 2000 with the 2001 supplement. 
So are we cherry picking? Yep. Should we be doing that? We're trying to give you guys an idea of what the design and construction requirements are. So uh, we are kind of cherry picking, but we're not saying, I'm telling you, we're going to give you some different standards, but you can't, you, you, you got to stick with the standard you pick. All right, there are seven different re design requirements. We're going to go through these. Requirement number one is an accessible building entrance on an accessible route. All right. What is an accessible route? Well, an accessible route has two major components, the, the accessible route requirement. From a, a site, uh, 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 how one approaches the site, site arrival point, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on my words here, from a site arrival point to the building entrance and from the building entrance to covered common areas. So site arrival points, public transportation is a site arrival point. Uh, accessible parking is a site arrival point. A public sidewalk is a site arrival point. So from all of these different site arrival points, uh, you were required to have at least one route, at least one route, not necessarily everyone, but at least one route that connects the different types of site arrival points to the covered building entrance. So in this case, we have from the sidewalk and the bus stop, we have a route here, and we should have a route into this building, all right, because this is a covered building as well. So there should be a little black line connecting that right there. So there are two buildings on the site. Both are covered. Both are required to have an accessible route from the site arrival points, public transportation, sidewalks, public streets, to this point and to this point. Not every entrance is required to be compliant, at least one. So here we have site arrival point that's accessible parking. It is serving this entrance. Does it also serve this entrance? Not according to the plan that we have and the diagram we have on the screen. If we had a sidewalk that went around here and connected that, yes. This parking can serve this building and taking that accessible route can serve this building as well. Right? But because we do not have a, a, a connection here, then we do not have uh, uh, this parking right here has to serve this building, this parking has to serve this building, and the accessible route from the public site, or the public sidewalk, public right-of-way, and the bus stop has to connect at this point to get to this entrance or use this entrance. Okay? So we could have two accessible entrances, one back here and one here, that would serve the public right-of-way and our parking because of the way we laid out the site. We either could connect that here or we can come in through there. So there's option. The basic rule to remember is that it's a minimum of one accessible route that has to connect these elements to at least one building entrance, accessible building entrance. All right. Now, I am not covering local code. Your local code may be different. The IBC may be different. Your IBC 2012 may be different. But I'm giving you the minimum standards that HUD want, is expecting to see. And then once we're in the building, the second part of this is that we need to get from the building or this building to the covered site amenities. In our case, we have one swimming pool. We have one playground. So we need to get an accessible route to that swimming pool and to that playground. We also have a tennis court down here. All right. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. This tennis court, we've got a route down to this tennis court. You can see there's two of these routes. But we built this building on a cliff, on the top of a cliff, and we put the tennis court at the bottom. What, we'll talk about what we do when we have extremely steep sites. Let's talk about what an accessible route is. All right. An accessible route is at least 36 inches wide. It has a running slope. Uh, between 0 and 5 percent. Right. If we go over 5 percent, that's allowed, but if we go over 5 percent, you're on a ramp. 
right? And you can go as steep as 8.33% on a ramp. So 0 to 5% is a sidewalk, has to comply with sidewalk requirements. 5%, greater than 5% to 8.33% is a ramp. And a ramp has to have handrails and level areas, and we'll talk about that. All accessible routes cannot have a cross slope steeper than 2%. The cross slope is the slope of that accessible route of the, uh, the, that is the slope perpendicular to the direction of travel. So if I'm going north to south, the cross slope east to west of that sidewalk that I'm on, let's say I'm on a sidewalk, can't exceed a, a uh, cross slope of 2%, quarter of an inch per foot. All right, it's got to be able to slope to drain. That's good. But it can't, it can't exceed 2%. So let's talk a little bit. A couple things I want to talk about here. One, 36-inch minimum width. One of the things I want designers, and there's a lot of designers in the room, to take away from this session is my opinion. This is my opinion. And it deals with the dimensions that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be, the vast majority of dimensions we're going to be talking about, if not 100%, is either a maximum dimension, a minimum dimension, or a dimension that's stated in a range. All right? And as we go through there, notice this. And the reason I want to bring this up is because if we have a maximum dimension, you can design something to be a little bit less. Or a minimum dimension, you can design something to be a little bit more. This is 36 inches minimum. All right? And here's my horror story for you guys. Civil engineers, take note. The first site I ever went on, for the first client I ever had, big client I ever had on the Fair Housing Act, I was working for the defendant. The plaintiff sent their expert out. My job was to meet with their expert and to Keep him honest, if you will, as he went through and evaluated these sites. And I got to tell you, I was nervous. This is the first time I've done it. The experts, or the, 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 the defendant's expert, had written books on the Fair Housing Act. I hadn't even read those books. I was young and naive, all right? Why this firm hired us, I'll never know, but thank God they did. So we get to a site, it's, in, it's outside of Denver, Colorado, and I park at one end of the site, and it's you know, 8 o'clock in the morning, and the uh, defendant's expert parks at the other end, and we basically got there at the same time. We get out of our car, and this is, we're walking toward each other, right? And I, this is like shoot out at the OK Corral. I mean, this is going to be my, for the next year and a half, I got nothing but arguments with this guy, I figure. So we meet, we shake hands, and because of the way this particular uh, clubhouse was laid out. The accessible parking was on a slope. The accessible parking was one end of the parking lot, and it had a three-foot wide sidewalk from the accessible parking that took us to the entrance of the clubhouse. The clubhouse entrance had steps to get up to it, all right, which is fine, not a problem. So, but, you know, a nice big wide, 10-foot wide walkway to get up to the club, clubhouse. But we went up to the, the accessible route, and the uh, defendant's expert, uh, let's call him Peter, uh, he squatted down and he took out his tape measure and he took it out of smart level and he put a smart level down and he measured the cross slope of the sidewalk and he measured the width of the sidewalk. And I'm looking over his shoulder going, okay, here we go. I'm looking over his shoulder and it's right on 36 inches. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, not going to be a problem. He, back, he goes up the next, the next square in the concrete, you know, four or five feet. And he squats down and he measures the width of this thing. He puts a smart level down. Smart level reads OK. And he, I'm looking at it and it's right on 36 inches. And I say, OK, we're, we're doing good. So far, so good. And he goes to the next square and he does the same thing. And I'm reading 36 inches and it, it looks great. And I'm through, you know, he's kind of shaking his head no every time he puts the, the, the tape measure down. Kind of like, eh, no, no. And he kind of looks at it, no, no, taking notes. So two thoughts go through my mind. One is, is he going to measure every square of concrete on this site? He did. We had over 3,000 lineal feet of sidewalk. 15 buildings, clubhouse. This is on the outskirts of uh, Denver, a lot of land, 
lot of space between this stuff. Rolling slopes, rolling. He measured every square. It took us almost a week just to do the sidewalks. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to take 10 years to do this project. Well, as he got used to us and we got used to him, things got better. And we, he didn't do every square for, every, every, for all 71 properties. Did not. Um, but the other thing that went through my mind is kind of why is he shaking his head no? So I asked him, I said, Peter, you seem to be not a, you know, having a problem with this 36 inch dimension. And he said, well, Jack, it's not 36 inches. And I said, well, Peter, it's right on 36 inches, exactly 36 inches. He said, well, yeah, the concrete is 36 inches wide. He said, but the accessible route isn't. And I said, well, what are you talking about? It's a sidewalk. Well, the contractor had tooled the edge of the sidewalk with a quarter inch radius on both sides because he didn't want a square corner. That quarter inch radius, the last eighth of an inch, on both sides was steeper than 2%. He said, so this is not 36 inches wide, Jack. It's 35 and 3 quarters of an inch wide. I said, oh, come on. Come on. And this is my introduction to... <laughs> I said, you got to give me a construction tolerance on this. He goes, no, I don't. I said, well, yeah, you do. I said, it's, it's it. And he said, nowhere is it defined. Nowhere. The guidelines don't talk about a construction tolerance. ANSI might, right? But ANSI 86, I don't think did. And he said, the guidelines don't. He said, so I don't have to give you that. And I thought, well, if you, that's the way you're going to be. I said, well, this one's going to go to the lawyers. So I disagreed with him. So the first measurement out of the box, the lawyers had to get involved. These are Washington, D.C. lawyers and New York lawyers. Their average building rate is more than all of our average building rate in here for two lawyers. Right? And they finally resolved that, and we kept saying we have to have construction tolerances. We have to have that. And they kept saying they're not defined. We said, then we'll define them. And so we flew out to Connecticut, spent two days with Peter and his group. He came out to our office and spent two days with us, and we went through every single dimension in the Fair Housing Act and developed a construction tolerance for it. And it worked out okay. But what I'm telling you is that they, there's question. Uh, we have a question from a, a remote viewer. Since Idaho's Fair Housing Act covers providers with two or more units rather than the four plus like the federal act, how does this affect the accessibility requirements for new construction duplexes and triplexes? Well, my instant answer to that is uh, if you have a development that is just duplexes and it's covered by Idaho, you have to comply with the Idaho requirements for it. If the Idaho requirements are the guidelines or IBC or whatever they are, then you would apply the Idaho requirements to those, develop to those buildings. Okay? If you have some buildings that are four or more within that same development and there's a conflict there, then for those that are four or more, they have to comply with the Fair Housing Act. But if it's less and there's state and local requirements for that, then you have to follow the state and local requirements. All right? So back to my construction tolerances. Understand that if this dimension had been 38 inches, and why do we engineers and architects always go to an even number? I don't know why. We would never say 37 inches. It's 38 or 40 or 42. We would always go to an even number. I don't know why we do that. Did something we learned in school? I don't know. But if it had been 38 inches, then that tolerance would have been built in. And if we're talking about mounting a grab bar at a certain height, and it can't be any higher than a certain height, and we mount it an inch lower, or a light switch, or an outlet, wall outlet, an inch higher, it's going to work the same way for all people and you're building in a construction tolerance. So if your contractor is just a little bit off, you're still safe, all right? Your contractor's still safe. But if your contractor builds it out of compliance, he, architects, you're gonna be involved in a complaint, all right? You're gonna be involved. I'm not saying you're getting sued, but you're gonna be involved. So that's uh, running slope. I'm a guy who uses a wheelchair I don't like to see ramps on sites. 
That comes as a surprise to most people. Ramps are hard to use. Ramps are difficult to use. You may have noticed the ramp, the sloped walkway to get into this building. It was not a ramp. It was less, it was 5% or less. Didn't have handrails on it, and it was easy to get up. If it had been 8.33%, the maximum slope for a ramp, I would have a real difficult time getting up. This wasn't a problem when I was 25 years old. But now that I'm 67 years old, it's a problem. I just don't have the strength I used to have. A lot of people, and just for the rest of this day, guys, this is all about me. All of this is about me. I use myself as the example because I was involved in writing the ADA, and I'm involved with FHA. It's all about me. Uh, no, I try to keep a very broad perspective on this. But I do use myself as an example. So try to avoid steep slopes. Try to avoid ramps. Ramps have to have handrails. Ramps have to have level areas every 30 feet. Ramps have to have a five-foot level area at the top and five-foot level area at the bottom. If you have a 42-inch rise, your ramp has to be 40 at, at maximum for at least 42 feet long. If it's 42 feet long, there has to be a level area in the middle. There has to be a level area at the top and five foot deep at the bottom too. So we're adding 15 feet to 42. You're responsible now for 57 feet of property, right? If you had just sloped that at one and 20, you wouldn't have handrails to worry about, and the skateboarders wouldn't have challenges to jump up, and, the, and they wouldn't have to be painting these uh, things every five years or three years or whatever, right? So try to avoid ramps if you can. My advice, my opinion, my advice. Try to avoid that. And cross slope, build in a, instead of 2% on your drawings, civil, put 1.5%. Contractors are going to complain. I get that. Do we have contractors in the audience? One, two, all right? Contractors are going to say, you're going to say, it's really hard to build at 1.5. I know, it's hard to build at 2. We did in the city of Chicago, $50 million lawsuit against the city of Chicago for cross slope sidewalks and curb ramps. And we, uh, my office developed the design standards for the city to comply with this. And we put in 1.5%. And a lot were torn out after the first year. Very few were torn out after the second year. Because the contractors realized, if I don't do this, I'm going to be tearing them out and redoing them. And yes, it is a little bit more difficult. There is no question about that. But you end up with a cross slope that's easier to use and doesn't exceed 2%. Because right? if you design it at 2% and it's 2.1%, we were telling them, take it out, because it, the litigation was involved. So take that into consideration. Use these maximum minimums and range to your advantage. If a dimension is stated in the range, use architects dimension that at height of a toilet at 17 inches. Right? Don't say a range of uh, 17 to 19 inches. Right? Or I'm sorry, dimension at 18 inches. Put it in at 18. Build in an inch tolerance on both sides. Everybody is going to benefit from that. I have never had a developer or a builder tell me that 38 inches is too expensive, put it at 36. Every time I've said this in front of developers, builders, they say, oh yeah, we agree. We want that protection. All right, where accessible routes are required? We talked about pedestrian arrival areas, site arrival areas, site facilities and amenities, and then once you get in the building, accessible routes are required. We're going to get into all that. So we're required to have accessible parking that serves the, site, that serves the buildings. Site amenities are required to be on an accessible route. One area that surprises people where accessible routes are not required, and that is to connect covered buildings. So if I've got four buildings on a site, building A, B, C, and D, I've got to have at least one route that gets me from site access points to those four buildings and from those four buildings to the common areas, to a pool, the clubhouse, mail, trash, all that sort of stuff. But there is no requirement to have a route that connects building A to building B, or building A to C, D, C to B, B to C, any of that. Right? There's no requirement. If you, now, generally, when you lay out a site, you're going to, you're the requirement for one minimum accessible route to connect what does have to be covered, all right, the least one route has to connect from site arrival points to the building and from the building to the common areas, you're going to end up with a route that connects building A to building B and C to D and D to A, and you're going to end up with that, all right? But if for some reason you don't, Right? and you choose to provide the, a route, 
Then HUD says that that route can't be any steeper than 8.33%, but you're not required to provide the grab bars, I'm sorry, the handrails, because you've got a route that is steeper than 5%, it's a ramp, but if it's only connecting buildings, covered dwelling units, that's the purpose of that route, you are not required to provide handrails along that, right? If it's, if it's part of a route that connects site access points to the building and the building in the common areas, then it would be required. But if it's only connecting buildings, then it's not required. Question in the back? But get, get the microphone. Wait, 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 wait. So the, the HUD DOJ guidance um, on accessibility, accessibility in design and construction, uh, number 29 says, does the act permit multi-cover dwelling units to be designed and constructed in a manner that requires persons with disabilities to use an indirect or circuitous route to enter a building or unit or to use locks or call buttons that are not required of other persons? And it says no, under the Fair Housing Act, persons with disabilities must be able to enter their dwellings through the same entrance that is used by other persons to enter their dwellings. And then it says, um, therefore, accessible routes cannot be hidden, remote, circuitous, or require people with disabilities to travel long distances. Furthermore, the accessible route to the primary entrance must not place special conditions on one person with disabilities, such as a special key attendant, et cetera. So that, I mean, that's a little bit, give, I mean, I think that gives us a little more interpretation of what that might look like. That's a Q&A, right? Yeah. It's yeah. under the HUD DOJ guidance. Um, and, right. And I always, when we get to this on the site, I'm going to talk about circuitous routes. It's not a good idea. But given the documents, the guidelines, design manual, that word circuitous does not appear. That's a Q&A, and it's good advice. And I say, if, if you follow that advice, you're, you, you won't get in trouble. I showed you a diagram of two buildings on a site. And I showed you where if you connect these two sidewalks, then that one parking space can serve those two buildings. I'll stand by that. There's no, I don't know what circuitous, there's no definition for circuitous, right? But if that parking space required a person to go out, down, and go a half a mile to get to that second entrance, that I would say common sense tells you that's circuitous. And that's not going to hold up. But there's nothing in the requirements in the guidelines that say that when we get to parking, there's going to be a 2% requirement for accessible parking, um, that they ha that parking has to be located at every building, and it has to be on the shortest route. Follow-up question? Uh, Let me get the microphone. I think the point they're trying to make is that it's difference in treatment. They're saying a person who um, is not disabled uh, or a person who is disabled should have the same access route as someone who is um, able. So that's, I think that's the statement that the HUD DOJ guidance is giving. That, uh, that, yeah, that, there's no question in my mind that's true. You can't have, you talked about entrances. You can't, the accessible entrance can't be a service entrance that, it's got to be a public entrance. Yeah, that's a good point to make. It's got to be a public entrance. I mean, the ones I showed you were public entrances. You couldn't, you couldn't use a service entrance to get into a clubhouse and we're going to have examples of that later. Yes? We have a remote uh, viewer's question. Did the 36-inch sidewalk comply? <coughs> I think they're referring back to the, um, your, your story about the 36 inches. If the, if the width of the accessible route was at least 36 inches, then it's in compliance. The example that I gave you is outside to outside was 36. The width of the accessible route with a slope that is uh, cross slope no more than 2% was 35 and 3 quarters. That was eventually accepted. Eventually accepted. 35 and 3 quarters. Had it been 32, it wouldn't have been accepted. You know, because that's not a construction tolerance. Construction tolerance is not going to exceed a half inch. I'll just throw that out, in my opinion, just a half inch. But if, if so, there was a question in the back? No? Okay. Accessible route within the buildings. We have to get an accessible route from the accessible entrance, or, or, or all of the accessible entrances, to the common areas within the building. So this is a fitness center. Once we enter the fitness center, we need to get 
a three, uh, an accessible route, three foot wide, to at least one type of each of the, the equipment under the ADA. But under the Fair Housing Act, we just need to get into this space. Okay? Now, if there was back in this corner, there was a bathroom that served this fitness center, that would be a common area, and we'd have to get an accessible route to get us back to that bathroom. All right? If there's towels being distributed within that room, there's a towel rack. And that's a common element, and we would need an accessible route to get to that, that towel rack. All right? But there is not a requirement under the Fair Housing Act until HUD adopts the new 2010 ADA standards as their standards here, um, that, that then there is no requirement to get under the guidelines, under what I'm talking about, an accessible route. 2008, was it, IBC, may have had that requirement. They may say, you're required to have an accessible route to get to one of each type of machine. It's conceivable. But it's not until 2010 that that become a standard under the ADA. But this space doesn't have to comply with the ADA. It has to comply with the FHA. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So accessible route is required to be able to get into every common use space. And once you're in, if there's common use areas there, then, uh, then you have to... Uh, be able to get to those common. Question? Seven minutes to break? There's my, there's my, my red flag. Okay, great. We've talked about these elements of an accessible route. Uh, here's a good example of these are individual entrances to building, a covered building. So the ground floor is covered here. There's no elevator in this building. So we have to get an accessible route to every one of these entrances. So this is basically a bridge that takes us around to the back of this building to get us to the entrance that's the back of that building. Now, let's talk about this. This will probably take our, uh, our, our six minutes remaining until break time, and it's a good place to break. I mentioned earlier, what if you're on a real steep site? All right? We've got a pedestrian route that gets us down to the, to the tennis court. We have a pedestrian route here, stairs that get us down to the tennis court. But these are stairs. All right? There is a provision in the Fair Housing Act guidelines that says if the Slope, the, if the, the finished slope between covered elements is greater than 8.33% and that finished slope is outside of the control of the owner, and that's a critical statement, outside of the control of the owner, it's basically saying if you could provide an accessible route, you should have. Right? But in an extreme, extreme example here, right? These are very, very steep. You are not required to provide an accessible route to connect elements if the slope of that finished grade outside of the control of the owner is greater than 8.33%. So here, tennis court is located at the bottom of this cliff. I'll refer to this as a cliff, bottom of this cliff. And so we're not required because of existing site conditions greater, greater than 8.33%. We're not required to provide an accessible route down there but we are required to buy, provide a way to get down there, and that way would be a vehicular route. So the exception on steep sites, steeper than 8.33% outside of the control of the owner, is yeah, you may not have to provide an accessible sidewalk or walkway, but you would have to provide a route to get down there for a vehicle. So your choice, civil engineers and architects, what's more expensive, this route, to get a parking space down here, or a ramp to get us down here, all right? You can pick one or the other. Or, and we're gonna get to this later this afternoon, or considering these conditions when, the, when you're planning, what would you guys say is a solution to this problem? Steep site, long, long, circuitous ramps, connecting our, tennis court, or a, a street that gets us down to this tennis court? Does anybody see another solution? How about locating this tennis court here? Put it in an accessible area to begin with so that you don't have to deal with this. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there may be planning elements you want to consider up front early on in the design. Because if you make, if you say this is, this is your early design and, you know, it's, 
it's under construction and somebody's taking a look at it or it's you're doing final plan review on this and somebody points out, hey, how are we getting down to this? Right? Well, we're going to have to pay for a street. You might want to consider putting that common area, covered common area, in an accessible location to begin with. So it's very easy. Yes, sir. Microphone, please. Right here. I'd hit him with the green laser pointer, but I don't want to throw it out an eye. So the, uh, s the street that comes around the back of the building could actually be a uh, three-foot ramp and yes. avoid the cost of the, all the other pavement? Yep, it could be. It could be three feet wide, all right? But if you're more than 200 feet in length, you've got to have a five-foot wide area. If it's, you, you, use, you use the term ramp, so I'm going to go with that. If it's a ramp, it's going to have to, if it's deeper, uh, between 5 and 8.33 percent, it's going to have to have a level area of 30 feet. It's going to have to have handrails on both sides. So you could do this coming around. Maybe you could get that in at less than 5 percent. You could come here and have a ramp that connects all of this. But you're going to have to have all those bells and whistles for a ramp. Any other questions about this? Yes, sir. This is a different question. Okay. Uh, this particular uh, development has to go through a city or a conditional use permit. Or say, special, say, say that again. A special use permit or a conditional use permit to, to get this approved. No, it, not under the Fair Housing Act. No, no, no. I'm asking the question. Uh, say this has to go to the Plain Zoning Commission okay, to be approved. Is the city responsible in their conditions to uh, state that uh, something within this development does not comply to the Fair Housing Act? Is, the question is, is, if everybody didn't hear it, is the city, would the city have responsibility if everything doesn't comply with the Fair Housing Act on this? Because they, the city they, had to approve or disapprove something. Right. My understanding, and I'm not a lawyer, there's a lawyer in the back, but my understanding is that no, the local municipality has no responsibility to enforce or if something is designed and constructed wrong under the Fair Housing Act, they don't have the responsibility of catching that. Let, let, right. Now, in my, while the microphone's going back there, in Chicago, we have a department that does do that, and they would catch this if they, because they're knowledgeable about the Fair Housing Act. They would say, hey, this doesn't comply with, for whatever it is, doesn't comply with the Fair Housing Act. All right? And, and they would say, we recommend you, but th they are not empowered to enforce the Fair Housing Act. Yes? So, so there, realize there might be other code provisions um, if it's incorporated in your city or county code or your state code, um, and which many of us are, um, it may enforce that provision of the Fair Housing Act. So you might, might want to refer to that. It also may refer to other civil rights laws. So you want to make sure that even if you, the code official doesn't have to necessarily enforce the Fair Housing Act, they may have a duty under Section 3608 of the Fair Housing Act um, to affirmably further fair housing, and in most jurisdictions, they've identified design and construction as a barrier to um, for persons with disabilities, um, and so that may be you may be drawn into it that way. So cities okay. should take it upon themselves. Because so it wouldn't be under design and construction, but it would in, be under the, in the yeah in the state co state and city code. In most yeah. instances, we do notify um, cities or counties if there is noncompliance because of the code provisions, but we also notify them because. Uh, most cities, or most of our uh, jurisdictions have been really good about doing their um, um, AIs or their analysis of impediments and have identified design and construction as an issue for our communities throughout Idaho. And so that's another way that um, code officials can do their best to make sure that all people have access to accessible buildings. So. But if a code official misses something, they can't be held responsible for missing something, or can they? Um, what we do is we, we ask them to withhold their occupancy permits. So if they should have enforced the code and they didn't or, or address the building permits, then we ask them to withhold the building permits or yeah. the occupancy permits. Right. So that's and, how we enforce it. And that's what we do in Chicago, too, so the same type of thing. But let's say five years later, somebody like me was going through the development and saying, hey, these areas are not compliant. The, code of, the local code official can't be held responsible for that, can they? Or can they? Under local, under local code. All right. Well, okay, we're going to get a different question. Just a, a real quick question about uh, accessibility. So this uh, design solution is predicated upon an individual having a car. Um, is there a special accommodation if they don't have a car? How would they be able to get down to the uh, tennis court? Excellent, excellent question. The, the, 
Yeah, this solution is predicated on that somebody has a car, and most people with disabilities, I mean, the, the, the class of people with disabilities are the poorest class in this, in this country. And that's why this outside of the control of the owner is a critical element. Because if DOJ gets involved or HUD gets involved, they're going to look at that with a fine uh, uh, microscope in terms of could the, the owner have done something different? Because they're very aware of that situation. And that's why, that's why there is a requirement for a pedestrian route is because people with disabilities may not have cars, may not be able to drive cars, may not want to transfer in and out of cars to go get their mail. All right, when it's 200 yards away. You know, they want, just want to push over there. So, uh, and the other thing before we break, the Fair Housing Act is basically about people in wheelchairs. The design and construction stuff that I'm talking today. Congress said that, acknowledged that. It's not about, it's not as much about people uh, deaf and hearing impaired, blind or visual impairments. All right, we will talk a little bit about some of those things. We'll bring them up. But it's basically about people in wheelchairs which is, a sh in my opinion, a shortcoming of the act, but that's it is. All right, question before we break? No, I was going to say you, you wanted to know whether it's not, it's not, there's no test case on that thus far against code officials, but because of Westchester County, I think most, if most people know it, the, the Westchester case, nobody wants our, our cities or our jurisdictions to have their money withheld because they weren't yep. um, complying with furthering fair housing, so that's. No, that's it, that's a yeah. good one. That's yeah. good, so, that's terrific. That would be my argument, so. Good. <laughs> And it, we're good about it, so I, I appreciate it. Yeah, when, when it, it's great. When local municipalities are good about enforcing this stuff, you end up with a lot of accessibility. I mean, the state of California is pretty good about enforcing. The city of Chicago is pretty good about enforcing. There's not really a question. When I go anywhere in the city of Chicago, am I going to run into barriers? They're really old buildings that I might. But it really works. When people enforce this, it really works well. All right, no other questions? Let's break. For 10 minutes, uh, at quarter after, I'm going to get started again.
you say it's 2009, huh? both wrong.